All right, let's get started. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Hong Kong U. Um, I'm an associate professor in the Department of Psychology. Uh, I, I'm very happy to be here today uh, to give a mock lecture. Can you hear me? Yeah, good. Um, so hopefully after the lecture, you will like psychology more rather than less, okay? Uh, so the topic for today is developmental cognitive disorders. So you can tell from the name, from the title, um, it's related with developmental psychology and cognitive psychology. I will also include some discussion on neuroscience um, <clears throat> because, you know, when you want when you want to study psychology, you have to consider the brain, right? Um, <clears throat> okay. All right. So here's the outline for today's lecture. We will be talking about uh, the basics of developmental cognitive disorders first, and then I will be. Um, talking about development of dyslexia as an example of developmental cognitive disorders. For developmental dyslexia, we'll have um, discuss discussions on um, definition, diagnosis, um, the relationships between genes, brain, and behavior. If we have time, I'll cover intervention as well. Okay, so um, what, what is developmental cognitive disorders, right? So these are some examples. <clears throat> ASD, autism, you might have heard about it, right? Autism is some impairment in social communication, um, which can be diagnosed as early as two years old, around two years old. Another example would be SLI, specific language impairment. And this number here is the prevalence. 1.8% of the population are diagnosed with ASD, according to um, Center of Disease Control in the United States. And then for SLI, specific language impairment, it means <clears throat> specific to language, right? So the intelligence, the cognitive abilities are fine. So these children have specific issues with their language development. You may also um, have heard about it in other names, for example, language delay or um, late talkers, right? So <clears throat> uh, in research, the name is SLI, specific language impairment. And this is a prevalence. DD, developmental dyslexia, which is a problem in reading specifically, okay? Um, they may have some issues with language, but not necessarily. Some people may have totally fine language, but then when they start to uh, learn to read, they have problems. So it's called developmental dyslexia, okay? So this is my... Um, main topic for today. So for me, myself, I do research on ASD and DD, ADHD, attention problems, okay? Um, so the prevalence is 9.5. Another one is motor coordination disorder, um, learning disability, and also stuttering. So if you sum up the numbers here, Okay, the, pre the prevalence. So the total number is around 40%. It's a huge number, right? 40% of the population has one or more than one um, condition in D DCD, some kind of DCD, right? So that's why it needs attention. And that's why people in psychology should contribute to this area. Okay, 
some important things about um, DCD that we need to know. It's developmental in nature, which means it's different from acquired disorders. What does it mean? <clears throat> developmental in nature means it's innate. So people are born with it, okay? <clears throat> it's not something acquired later in life, like uh, due to some brain injury or some kind of disease, right? Like stroke or some accident, right? So you see that in, in people um, like, uh, <clears throat> it's called um, aphasia, right? People cannot talk after stroke, right? So that's acquired. That's acquired disorder. But for a developmental disorder, what I will be talking about today is a condition that's um, innate, okay? So they are born with it, but uh, um, the diagnosis has to depend on behavior. Until they show the inappropriate behavior, we are able to diagnose it. We don't know when they are born, who has it or who doesn't have it, okay? So it's developmental in nature. <clears throat> However, we don't know the, the causes. Why some people have it and some people don't. We don't know the reason yet, okay? Unknown causes. However, we know it's highly in, uh, heritable. Highly heritable. <clears throat> the number here means if one of your parents has it, the chance for you to have it is between 40 to 60%, okay? So that means there are definitely genetic origins. It can pass from one generation to the other, to the next, right? <clears throat> but again, we don't know the exact uh, genetic factors yet. We don't know the, the, the whole picture yet. Um, we also know there are neurological deficits associated with the DCD. So every problem in the behavior is caused by something in the brain, right? By some deficit in the brain. So it's not surprising um, to see abnormal neurological um, developments in those children, right? <clears throat> um, and also we know there are more males than females, four times more males than females, okay? Again, we don't know exactly why yet. There's comorbidity, which means they co-occur. Um, so for example, one child who has autism may also have language de delay, right? Um, so it suggests there might be some common uh, reasons underlying different kinds of DCD, right? Um, we don't know. So everything is still under um, investigation. So for DCD, another thing is the diagnosis and treatment can only be done at the behavioral level, right? So because it's, it's a complex um, condition, it's related with high level cognition language, um, learning, um, social communication, attention, right? So those are very high level uh, human cognition. And uh, we don't have a blood test for that because the causes are very complex and we don't know the exact causes yet, right? So um, for the diagnosis, we have to wait and see until the appropriate behavior shows up. The same for treatment. Treatment is also at the behavioral level. So even though, right, they have this condition born with them, it doesn't mean there's nothing we can help, right? So we can help them at the behavioral level, teach them how to behave, teach them how to read, how to learn language, right? And this kind of treatment is very powerful and useful for them. And now it's the only way they can get help, okay? So that's why psychology plays a very important role 
in this area to help people, help children. Okay. <clears throat> and uh, we also know for people with uh, DCD, there are huge individual differences. Both children are diagnosed with autism, but they can be very different. So there's a huge individual difference. Okay, <clears throat> so these are some very important facts that we should know about DCD. And it helps us to um, understand this condition to do research on DCD, right? So <clears throat> why do we care? Why do we, why do we, every year so much money and people are, you know, um, devoted to the to this kind of research, right? But why? Why do we care, right? So the number I just mentioned, in total, almost 40% of the population has some kind of DCD, right? That's one reason. Um, <clears throat> but another reason, there are other reasons, right? Um, DCD cause, causes social emotional issues. It's very frustrated when you cannot speak or when you can't read right, in school for young kids. So it will cause emotional issues, um, which further causes low self-esteem and uh, behavioral problems. Yeah, question? Sorry, we can't hear you. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, I'll make sure it works. How about now? Okay. Uh, so <clears throat> DCD um, cause, causes emotional issues, right? Which will cause uh, low self-esteem and behavioral problems in children. And that's definitely not something we want in school in classroom or in family, right? So we care. Um, we want to help those children. <clears throat> it also causes low social economic status in adulthood. So when these children grow up, they tend to be um, in the lower social economic status because a lot of them drop from school before high school. Um, and also equal opportunity. We want them to have this opportunity to learn, uh, to develop, right? Um, so it's not just their problems, it's our problems as human beings and the scientists, okay? So that's why we are studying DCD. <clears throat> okay, for the rest of the lecture today, I will be focusing on developmental dyslexia. Um, like I said, it's a specific impairment in reading. So these children are totally fine children. Nobody can tell they're different if you don't let them read, okay? So they, they have very specific impairment in reading, in learning to read. So this is a definition of developmental dyslexia. It's a specific and a significant impairment in reading abilities, unexplained, by any kind of deficits and in general intelligence, learning opportunity, general motivation, or sensory acuity. I don't know if you like this definition or not, but I don't, okay? I, to be honest, I don't like this definition. Why? <clears throat> because it, didn't tell, it doesn't tell us what the, the development of dyslexia is. It only tell, tells us what it is not, right? It's not um, explained by intelligence or learning, right? But it didn't say anything about what it really is, right? The reason is we don't know. We don't know what it is. We only know what it is not, okay? So that's why um, the definition is exclusionary because we don't know the cause or the mechanisms yet. So that's uh, what, we, what we can define, how we can define development of dyslexia for now. Okay, so, so then how do we diagnose development of dyslexia? So for practical diagnosis, we have, um, this is for a clinical setting, okay? For clinicians, if you are a clinician, 
a child comes to you, right? You need to decide whether the child has um, developmental dyslexia or not. And then you can decide whether you need to provide service to him or not, right? So then how do you define, how do you diagnose? <clears throat> Discrepancy uh, criteria, this is um, what we used to use, okay? What we used to use um, to screen developmental dyslexia. So discrepancy means a difference, right? Difference between two things, that means discrepancy. But this is the, the, the difference between what? Between what two things? Any thoughts, any guess? So if you want to define developmental dyslexia and you are using a discrepancy definition, so what, can, what, what is this discrepancy? You're looking at a difference between what two things? There are two things, right? The discrepancy between what and what? What do you think? It's about reading ability and what? Um, the understanding part is right. So the discrepancy is between the reading level and the intelligence level. So how he understands in general. Okay, so <clears throat> that's the definition we used to use in clinical setting. So when the child comes in, we test him on the intelligence and then test him on the reading. So if his intelligence is this high, right? But his reading is much lower. There is a significant discrepancy between intelligence and reading. Then we diagnose him as reading disability or developmental dyslexia, right? So that, that means according to your intelligence level, you should be reading at this high, right? But your actual reading is here. So that's how we define um, developmental dyslexia. But I, I emphasized, I said, we used to use it, right? But we don't use it anymore. We don't use this definition now, right? Why? Is it reasonable? Is it a reasonable way for people to be diagnosed? No? Exactly. Yeah, exactly. So <clears throat> that happens to one of my friends, actually. It's a, it's a real story. So one of my friends told me he has developmental dyslexia. And I, I said, I, I don't believe it. You Because you read totally fine. You read totally normal. Um, but he said, I was diagnosed using the discrepancy definition. And the reason is because his intelligence is like 140 or something, right? Too high, very high, 140. And uh, his reading is normal, like 100, right? 100 is the average level. And 140 is much higher. So, so he is diagnosed, even though he's totally fine reading, right? So that's, the, that's one example um, that we find this definition um, unreasonable, right? <clears throat> Another example would be the other kind of, the other extreme um, example would be a, a child with low intelligence, say 80, right? And then his reading is 70. So then the discrepancy is only 10, right? He doesn't qualify according to the discrepancy definition because the, the intelligence and the reading are not significantly different, right? So the, the distance is not um, big enough for him to be qualified. But the reason is his intelligence is low. His intelligence is 80 and his reading is 70. So obviously in these two examples, in the two cases, the second child needs intervention or needs a service more than the first one, right? 
But according to this discrepancy definition, the first child qualifies and the second one doesn't um, have the opportunity to get service, right? So that's why we think this discrepancy definition should be <clears throat> out of the picture, right? Um, so again, this is for the purpose of clinical settings. If you want to decide who gets service, who, who doesn't, right? So this definition is not appropriate. So here I listed the reasons why we don't like this discrepancy definition. The first one is um, it's not acceptable to compare scores from two standardized tests, right? One is intelligence, one is reading, and these two standardized tests are developed using different norms. So it's not acceptable to compare them. Uh, so that's one reason. Another reason is just like we said, people who need help do not qualify due to low IQ, okay? So it's not um, fair. The third one is people with low IQ still benefit from intervention. So even though their IQ is only 80, but if you teach them reading, they can learn and they can grow better, right? So they are the people who need service. IQ drops with time for children with DD. <clears throat> so that's the, the last, um, I don't remember which one, but the, another reason. So IQ, right, it's, it's, it's not something stable. It changes. It changes with learning, right? So for a child who has learning disability or who has reading disability, his learning will be different than other kids. He doesn't like to read, right? And reading is a very important way to learn. So then that means his brain will be developed differently than other people. So his IQ will actually drop. It's very sad and unfortunate, unfortunate, right? So, so what happens when his IQ drops? So when his IQ drops, the discrepancy gets smaller. The discrepancy between IQ and the reading gets smaller, right? And then he doesn't qualify anymore. It's, it's really sad. He doesn't qualify anymore because his IQ drops, not because his reading increases, right? So usually when we say, okay, you don't need service anymore. That's because you improved, right? You can, you can go back to the uh, normal classroom. You don't need the service anymore. But in this case, you let a child um, go out of your service, not because their reading is, is better, but because their IQ is lower, right? So this is another reason we, uh, we want to use another definition. <clears throat> So now what do we do? We don't like the discrepancy definition. Then now in clinical, again, in clinical settings, this is what we do now. We only compare reading to the age matched control to other children who are at the same age. So we don't compare their reading to their own intelligence anymore. We only compare their reading to other people's reading. As long as your reading is low, you're, you're fine, you're, you're qualified, we will provide service, okay? So <clears throat> 1.5 standard deviation below the mean on reading measures or two grades lower than your actual age, you will qualify, okay? Of course, it, all, it always depends on the available resources. Here it means clinicians. How many clinicians we have? Do they still have um, availability to take more cases? Okay, so that's a profession or an area that always needs more people, either here or in other countries, either in Hong Kong or in other countries. We need more clinicians to help. Okay, we, we always have more children than clinicians. Okay, <clears throat> so. That, but that's for clinical environment, for clinical settings. How about research? 
So for the purpose of research, it's different. So for research, our purpose is not to provide help anymore. Our purpose is to study it, is to understand the mechanisms, the reasons why some children have it and how we can help better, right? So that's for research. So for research, we have another kind of criteria. Actually, we, we still use discrepancy criteria for, for research, for research purpose. So your IQ has to be above 85 in the normal in the normal range. And your reading has to be low, like one standard deviation below the mean. And you, you cannot have other conditions. So we want to make sure we only study developmental dyslexia and your um your difficulty or your problems are not caused by other conditions like ASD or ADHD, right? So we want to find those children who only have developmental dyslexia in order to understand this disorder better. So that's a, uh, for research purpose. And also we have an emphasis on persistent reading failure. So that means persistent reading failure. So that means you may want to test them more than once. So some people may show disabled reading or lower reading ability uh, at a younger age due to the lack of opportunities or lack of appropriate instructions. If you provide instruction and learning opportunities, they'll catch up, right? So that's why we emphasize on persistent reading failure. Otherwise, it's not real um, developmental dyslexia if they can catch up. Okay. <clears throat> so that, that's about the definition of um, de developmental dyslexia, right? You need to consider um, whether it's fair or not, either for clinical settings or for purpose of research. But then after so many years of research, what do we know about DD? For behavior, we know um, their problem is mainly at the single word reading level. So they cannot decode the, the visual symbols. So we learn language naturally, right? Um, so by the age of two, um, a child should be able to speak a language fluently, right? Otherwise something's wrong. Right? Uh, but for reading, it's not something you can, you can acquire naturally, right? Uh, like my grandparents' generation, most people cannot read, right? So it's something you have to go to school for. You have to get the formal in education in order to be able to read. So reading is something different than language, okay? For language, everybody can learn it as long as you have this environment. But reading, you have to uh, get the instruction. So <clears throat> their problem is not at reading. Uh, at the language level, but at the reading level. So their language is fine. But when they go to school, they start to learn this new system, this visual system, right? Visual scripts, this symbol. We use symbols to represent our language, right? So they cannot uh, map the visual symbols to their language system. That's what happens in reading disability. As long as they can read it, they can decode it, they can understand it. So their language comprehension is fine. It's just that this decoding stage from visual symbols to language is disabled. So that's what we know, their, their behavioral level, as a behavioral level, what's the problem? <laughs> then as a cognition level, there are many studies, right? They, they have different findings. Some people found auditory processing deficits, um, some people found visual deficits, procedural learning, attention, working memory, right? <clears throat> but what I can tell you is um, it's not consistent, which means some people have deficits in working memory, some people don't. And some people have problems with procedural learning, some people don't, right? So the cognitive deficits are, not, are neither necessary nor sufficient to cause DD, which means 
if you have these deficits in cognition, it doesn't mean you will have reading difficulties, vice versa, right? If you don't have these deficits in cognition, it doesn't mean you will be fine in reading, right? There are people who are totally fine with these cognitive skills, but they, they just can't read. So, so then, you know, it's complex, right? So there is not a one-to-one -one mapping between cognition and reading. And this, like I said, at the beginning, there's, there are huge individual differences. It's a um, heterogeneous group, right? So what about the brain? <clears throat> so my, I myself study the brain and uh, we have a lot of findings about their brain differences. For example, the brain structure and also the brain function. Um, for example, the brain structure, <clears throat> the asymmetry of platinum temporality is uh, abnormal in these children. What does it mean? T platinum temporality is one part of the uh, temporal lobe, the posterior part of your temporal lobe. So temporal lobe is where you hear, you hear sounds, right? So the posterior part of your temporal lobe is usually much larger in your left hemisphere than in your right hemisphere, okay? Three times larger in your left hemisphere. So it's specialized for language. But in those children with DD, this asymmetry is abnormal. So their left, part, left tem plenum temporality is not enlarged as much as um, normal children. So that's a brain structural difference, okay? And there are also a, a lot of functional differences, like the brain activation are different. Some regions are supposed to be activated, but they're not using it in reading. Okay, so this, this evidence, this kind of evidence is interesting, right? But if you show me this kind of evidence or this kind of finding, what do you think? So I have a group of children with DD and a group of normal children and I compare them, right? Their brain are different. So what? So if you show me this kind of evidence, I would ask, so what, right? I don't need you to tell me their brain are different because they're so different. They, they have reading disabilities. They, re they cannot read. Of course, their brain should be different, right? <clears throat> so that's what I would think. Right, so that's the that's the issue here. It's not um, it we it's not enough to just know their brain are different, right? We want to know the causation, which causes reading disability, right? We want to understand the the causes, but this kind of evidence, of course, doesn't um, provide that kind of causation for us, right? Why? So if you have this kind of finding, can you say this part of the brain causes reading disability? Can you say that? No, why not? Right, yeah, exactly. We don't know the direction of causation, right? It might be that the abnormality in the brain is a result of being reading dis disabled, right? Like I said, the brain develops with learning. If you learn differently, your brain will be differently, will, will be differently activated or the even the brain structure will be different, right? So, <clears throat> We are not certain about the direction of the cause. You cannot say this is causing reading disability, right? So um, we need stronger evidence to help us to make this kind of causal conclusion, right? <clears throat> so that's why we are still doing more research along this line of um, research to, to understand DD. 
and also genetic issues. There are also a lot of researchers who study the genetics um, of people with DD, comparing it to uh, normal people. And these are some specific findings. So one, one thing I want to tell you about genetic uh, factors is we don't have a single gene to encode reading. Okay, it's not like there's a the gene, there's a gene which is responsible for your reading ability. Okay, it's way more complex than that. Reading is a very complex behavior. It um, it engages a lot of skills, and each skill is also um, related to multiple genes, right? And uh, the relationships between genes and reading. There are many layers in between. In between of them, right? So, um, for environmental factors, we know they are highly heritable, there are genetic factors, but also it doesn't mean the environment doesn't make a uh, contribution, right? Maternal education, language and preliteracy environments are important in reading development. And also <laughs> research found heritability changes with SES and parental education. So what does it mean? Heritability here, it means genetic factors, right? Genetic factors, environmental factors, they both contribute to uh, reading, okay? Um, <clears throat> the funding here means how much genetic factors contribute depends on the SES, okay? So it's very interesting, right? So depending on your SES means uh, social economic status. So we usually measure SES using home income or parental education, right? That's uh, uh, a way we can measure, measure um, SES. So depending on your SES, genetic factors may uh, play a different role or environmental factors may play a different role in determining how well you read, right? So that was your guess. Genetic factors play a more important role in people with high SES or low SES. So it's the relationship between nature and the nurture, right? So genetic factors are the nature and environmental factors are the nurture. So they, of course, they play together um, to determine a person's development, right? But now there's another variable, SES. It also plays a role <clears throat> in determining who plays the bigger role, genetics or environment. Any thoughts? So high, high SES means better environment, right? Um, more stimulation, more books, better preliteracy environment, right? Um, so in this kind of families, genetic factors are playing a bigger role or a smaller role? A smaller role, why? Okay, but you said the, the, the DD possibility will be lower, right? But, but the question is, um, the genetic factor can play a bigger role or smaller role in determining whether the child is um, reading disabled or not, okay? Um, 
So the answer is um, higher, actually. So for high ICS families, like we said, they already have the best environment. They have everything they need, books, stimulation, programs, like everything, right? Or, or extra help or parents reading with them, stuff like that. So the only chance they are reading disabled is due to genetic issues. That's why genetic factors are playing a bigger role in determining whether a child is reading disabled or not in high ICS family, okay? So for, for the other hand, <clears throat> children from lower ICS family, genetic factors are playing a smaller role and environmental factors are playing a bigger role, relatively, right, relatively, because their environment, there are, there are a lot of differences in their environment, right? So a lot of children have lower reading due to their environmental factor, not due to their genetic factors, okay? It makes sense? So <clears throat> this finding is very, um, intriguing when it's published in 2008. So people found the heritability is different depending on your ICS, right? So that's something we really need to um, be careful about, right? That's something we need to provide equal opportunity, right? For children with lower ICS, we want them to have the opportunity to learn to read, to read well just like the high SES children. The only reason you cannot read is because genetic, not because environment, okay? So we want the same for those from lower SES children, uh, family children. Okay, <clears throat> so that's what we want to know about environment. SES is not a reliable predictor of long-term language impairment. Again, this is because um, children from lower SES family will be able to catch up uh, if they have the chance to learn, to learn to read, right? So long-term, um, <clears throat> it depends on genetics rather than SES. So this is a summary of the um, different kind of factors that we just talked about, biological factors, cognitive factors, uh, behavioral features, what we want to say here, the take home message here is, um, there is no one-to-one -one mapping from one layer to another. The, the, the picture is very complex, right? So that's why we need to continue to um, study from different levels about DD. Okay, so this is the summary. Um, the important thing is uh, the second one, right? The genetic and neurological origins of DD does not mean there is nothing we can do about it. Everything we do about DD is for these two aims. Either you want to help with early identification or you want to help with effective intervention, right? It doesn't matter if you are studying their brain or if you are studying the genetic factors, the final goal is these two, right? Okay. Um, I, yeah, I think that's all for today. I also have intervention, but I, I, I'm afraid we don't have time for that. So if you have any questions, please raise your hand. Yeah. Um, I can I can hear the, the the last part what you said. So.
So you said you thought it was totally genetic, but then it has some environmental factors affecting the effects on DD or it's, it's some people are born with DD, I think, but I think so environmental factors are only affecting the effects of DD on children or is it is affecting the existence of DD on children, actually. Um, the environmental factors affects um, affects reading um, and then so so then some people will be diagnosed with DD and like I said if you have less opportunity your brain is developed differently so they actually show some difference uh, real difference in reading right so that's why environmental factor can influence your diagnosis um, but eventually right if you the child is lucky enough to have a really, you know, good school or good teacher. They they have a chance to catch up, but it doesn't mean for all children they will catch up. For a lot of children, they lost the the time. They lost it, right? But for some people, they may be able to catch up. But for more people, they cannot. They can never catch up. So that's the sad sadness of uh, unequal, you know, opportunity. Yeah, there's another question. Yeah. Which one? Yeah, the two intervention slides you were gonna say you you had no time to talk about. Could you just take a have a quick look at that? The interventions? Yeah, if that's okay. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, here. Yeah, there's another question here. Uh, I wanted to ask that you said that a, a low SES background in the parents may lead to a higher chance of an external factor affecting the affecting the child, whether or not they have DD. I want to ask that if what the reason that they have DD is that the parents have an underlying DD condition that has not been diagnosed, leading to low SES. As you said, it affects their cognitive learning abilities. So if they have undiagnosed DD, that would affect their own ability to learn and work, which may lead to a low SES. Yeah. So would it be a problem not because of the environmental factor, but that's their parents having DD being the underlying factor of genetic hereditary yeah, causes? That's, that's a great question. Um, that's a point I, I should have um, addressed, but I didn't uh, have the time. So actually, we were talking about genetics versus environmental factors um, as two opposites, but actually they are mixed. Because environmental factors has um, genetic factors in, in included, just like you said. Lower SES is a kind of a environmental factor, usually we think, right? But actually it might be caused by genetic issues. Um, it's, so it's, um, it's a broader concept rather than just, you know, uh, you have the parents also have DD and they have lower SES, right? It could be other situations like uh, <clears throat> in a house of um, musicians, right? They have a lot of instruments in their environment. And genetically, they might also have this advantage of uh, being a musician, right? So it's, it's mixed. So environmental factors may be confounded by genetic factors. Yeah, that's a very good point. So that I think for research, for research pur purpose, they should uh, be able to eliminate that kind of confound. For example, they need to exclude parents who have DD to make sure all of the parents do not have DD to be purely talking about environmental factors. So then they have the power to say that. Right. If they have a mix, then it's a re it's a problem with their research. Yeah. Yeah. Any more questions? Okay. 
this one. Well, thank you for your attention. And I hope to see you next year here in Hong Kong U. Okay, thank you.